I'm Rebecca Seitz, and this is Right to Life. I don't know if this experience is unique to me, but I never really thought that I'd be a mom. I mean, I did the thing where I named my future children when I played with my Cabbage Patch Kids and all, but it never felt like something that would actually happen. It was just a story, a dream, something way far off in the future. Motherhood felt like a very grown-up thing meant for older and wiser women, or at the very least, for when I felt like an actual adult. I was 25. Not even six months into my marriage to the love of my life, still getting over the shock that I somehow got to be this amazing man's wife when the stick turned pink. It did not feel real. After confirming at the doctor's office, I told family and my best friend. I remember calling my dad. He was up in Pennsylvania at the time, visiting his parents and his baby brother John and his family. When his cell phone rang, He was driving his car behind his brothers on their way to somewhere. I hope I never forget the joyous ring of his voice as he leaned his head out the window of his car and yelled, Hey, Johnny, Becky's pregnant. Even then, though, it did not feel real. It felt like I'd somehow stepped into a movie. Romantic wedding in a 400-year-old church on a tropical island? Check. Dashing, intelligent, unbelievable husband? Check. In-laws from yet another tropical place, operating like the Kennedys with their cocktail hours and dinner conversations about world affairs? Check. Job of my dreams at a major publishing house? Check. Big house in a big city? Check. And now, baby on the way? Check. And then... We went for the ultrasound to learn if we were having a son or a daughter. The tech joked with us, pointing at teeny little blobs on the screen and telling us, that's an arm, that's a leg, and oh, looks like a boy. My husband and I grinned, transfixed by a screen filled with foreign imagery. Suddenly, though, the tech lost her smile. She pressed that wand a little harder into my belly, and she kept it in one location. Is everything okay, I asked. She removed the wand, wiped it off, and said, I'll be right back. In that moment, I fell out of the movie, and I crashed into life. The dread. I remember the dread so keenly. Wanting to put my hand on my belly, but it was still covered in that jelly, resting my fingertips on it anyway, tapping on that goo. We learned that I had a single artery umbilical cord. It happens in about 1% of pregnancies that involve only one fetus, 5% in pregnancies that have multiples. See, the artery is what takes deoxygenated blood and waste away from the baby. But I clung to the fact that the survival rate was high at 80 to 95%. And the one artery that I did have, well, it was bigger than normal. My doctor assured me it it may even do the work of two. I was encouraged to just take it easy during the pregnancy. No working out, no getting out of breath if I could avoid it. Just be easy and let the pregnancy be the important thing. I ended up on bed rest for my final trimester, trying to stop the labor that kept starting and stopping. Forty days before his due date... And after three days of labor that would not end, followed by an emergency C-section, my firstborn arrived into this world at seven pounds, five ounces. Yes, he did have a complication. His eyes hadn't finished developing. We didn't even realize it at first. He often kept one eye closed, but he would switch which one he kept closed and which one he kept open, so we just laughed and thought he was winking. In truth... His eyes were developing independently of each other, like a chameleon. My kiddo was learning to see and process two objects at once. Otherwise, though, he was perfectly healthy. 
Pregnancies are such complicated experiences, unpredictable in thousands of ways. We had no history of problem pregnancies in our family that I know of, none in my husband's either. We both crashed headlong into parenthood that day. The tech went from Mm -hmm. laughing to all business. So too did Emily, and she would face a situation so much harder than mine. Emily, welcome to the Right to Life podcast. Thank you for being here today. Thank you so much for having me today, Rebecca. It is a very awkward question to ask women of, could you please let me record one of the most difficult times of your life? And I so appreciate when you're able to, like when you're healthy, mentally healthy and have gone through it and are able to say yes and do say yes. So I I don't gloss over that of thank you very much for being willing to come on here and talk about your story. Absolutely. And I'm, um, I actually just really appreciate the opportunity to share my story because I hope I, I think that it helps get into the complexity of the issues, um, and I want to share that with people so more people understand what um, what some of us have to go through. Mm-hmm. So you are a mom, right? Yes. <laughs> and so talk to me about your first pregnancy, though. Was it easy? Was it hard? Tell me about that. So I have a 16 year old girl, and she's my oldest, um, and she's amazing. Um, And my first pregnancy was a breeze. I was so happy to, I got pregnant really, you know, again, I I was was so fortunate, got pregnant very quickly um, after I wanted to, you know, after we started trying, my husband and I started trying and um, the pregnancy um, felt great. <laughs> I mean, I was exhausted, felt like I was hit right. by a shot, um, <laughs> in that middle section, like everyone. And, you know, you're, um, I was constantly bumping into things because I didn't know that my own the dimension. size of your body. <laughs> same, I, same. I loved being pregnant. And, um, I, 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 I was so happy. I, I was transfixed by, just seeing and understanding the changes in my body and the development of my baby. Mm-hmm. And, um, and it was awesome. I, I, I had such a wonderful first pregnancy. I was lucky to be very healthy. Um, I was in good physical shape. So it just, it, it, um, it was very smooth. And, and the and, birth? And the birth. I, um, I gave birth with midwives and the birth was mm. also very smooth. I did um, a pretty extensive um, prenatal birthing uh, classes um, called the Bradley Method, Um, Mm -hmm. and it's a method where you're really focusing on um, relaxing your body um, through the birth, Um, and so I did that, and it worked for me, and um, it was just an extraordinary, extraordinary experience. I... um, my baby was, she was big. She was uh, fairly big, eight pounds, six ounces, incredibly healthy. I was healthy. My midwives were yelling at me to stop um, taking walks with her in the, in the <laughs> immediately after I gave birth because I felt that good. So, you know, I had wow. this one view of pregnancy. And again, I, I um, speak understanding how fortunate I, I was with that first pregnancy and um, to have such an easy uh, easy, happy pregnancy. Mm-hmm. And then how long after your first pregnancy did you have your second pregnancy? So um, about three years later, um, mm-hmm. I maybe about two and a half years later, we, um, we started to try to have a second and it took a lot longer. Um, you know, again, you, you know, you only your own experience. So when you're not getting pregnant, right? You're, you know, when I wanted to be pregnant again, and it wasn't happening right away. And I, I can't remember precisely the time it might have been that we even tried for more like, um, you know, nine months or so. Um, mm. But and again, I realize that's a short time for some people who are trying and trying and trying. Um, but, but it feels forever, right? Like when you're t- every month, and you're like, No, not again. Hoping, 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 hoping. And, you know, for me, I was thinking about the the time between my kids. 
Um, I, mm-hmm. I wasn't ready for a long time to have another baby, even though I knew I wanted to have another one because I worked full time and I just felt like I had to make that complete connection with my my with my first baby, um, my older daughter, before I was ready to then be able to turn some of my attention away from her, which is which I had to mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. have another. And it took me my own journey was it took it, you know, it took me longer. And then I was really cognizant of the time, you know, the time growing between their ages. Um, mm-hmm. And so, um, yeah, I was pretty anxious to um, to get pregnant that second time. So how did you find out you were pregnant the second time? Um, I, um, I, I, I knew, pre- you know, because I was waiting, waiting, waiting. I knew mm-hmm. right away. I took a pregnancy test, was thrilled. Um, I had just moved that summer to the state of Maine, and it felt like kind of a um, – uh, I lived in D.C. previously, and, and um, where I live in Maine, it's just a, it's such a wonderful place to raise a family. And so I was just really focused on like, oh, we're at, we're in the right place now. This is mm-hmm. awesome, you know. Um, bought a new home, um, and so um, I yeah, I found out um, pretty pretty soon after we moved to Maine, I got pregnant and was just so thrilled. So you found out you were pregnant, and then probably did as we all do. You make an appointment with your doctor to go in and confirm, and then. Yeah. You, but there was a time when you found out that there was an anomaly happening with your pregnancy. What was that experience like? So at about 10 weeks, I went in for an ultrasound um, and I, my husband was there with me and um, the technician I remember was incredibly talkative and kind um, as she put the cold jelly on my lower belly and got started um, and then suddenly she went silent and the energy in the room just completely shifted. And she um, abruptly left, muttering nervously that she had to get the doctor. And mm-hmm. I, I need to I need to go back because I left out a really important part of the story. Okay. <laughs> so in when she was in that really talkative um, uh, time, she told me I was pregnant with twins, which I did not know. Um and so, you know, it was um, the p- twins do not run in my family. They do not run in my husband's family. Um, it was a complete surprise and, um, you know, extraordinary. Like twins. Wow. So, um, you know, suddenly I, and um, I'm a pragmatic person and maybe I shouldn't admit this, but some of the things going through my head were like, how do I get a uh, three car seats into my car (laughs) and then I work full time. So trying to think about like childcare and childcare Mm -hmm. is expensive and it was, Mm -hmm. you know, already expensive with one. Um, And so those like very, I mean, again, I can remember those very um, pragmatic thoughts going through my head where you're just trying to adjust to, wow, there's a, there's two babies. (laughs) (laughs) Did the yeah. did the ultrasound tech did she know that you did not know until she said something? Yes. Okay, so she knew she was yeah. giving you an announcement. She was giving us an announcement. <laughs> How fun! So it was a you know the shock. That's a lot to take in, and then the shift in the energy in the room I was telling you about. So it was just, um, it was it was a lot, uh, and the a doctor pretty quickly came in. And, um, and actually showed my husband and I what the technician had seen. And I, um, I could see with my own eye and without any medical experience, um, what the concern was. And with one of the babies, the, the neck was, was very, um, was very large. Um, mm-hmm. and that's really what I remember, you know, it was, um, just kind of the shock, the shock of it all. And then, you know, we went into, um, the doctor talked with us a little bit and we went in and talked with a specialist and she kind of walked through what they were thinking and what the, what the risks were. And so over the next few days, tests confirmed that, um, one of my babies had trisomy 18, which is a genetic disorder that affects nearly every organ system in the body. Mm. Um, yeah, half of babies um, that are born with trisomy 18 die within their first week of life. Mm. And 
I learned at the time that the median lifespan is five to 15 days. And oh. yeah, yeah. You know, and all of the, all of that is so much. But then I also had another baby that I was carrying. Mm-hmm. And, and that's um, how this got so complicated because there's a high risk of miscarriage with um, uh, um, or stillbirth, actually, with trisomy 18. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that put my my other twin at risk. I, you know, I could have gone into labor very, very early or um, or faced other serious complications. According to the Cleveland Clinic, trisomy 18 is also known as Edwards syndrome. An ultrasound tech is often the first to spot the signs of it, which include very little fetal activity, a small placenta, birth defects, and or a single artery umbilical cord. See, all humans have 46 chromosomes that divide into 23 pairs. Those chromosomes are what carry DNA in cells, which can be thought of like an instruction manual for how your body forms and functions. A fetus gets half of its chromosomes from one parent and half from the other. Now, so that I make sure to share this correctly with you, I'm just going to read directly from the Cleveland Clinic website. Quote, during egg and sperm formation, when chromosome pairs are supposed to divide, there's a chance that a chromosome pair will not divide, as if it's too sticky to separate. And both copies will be included in the egg or the sperm. So that when fertilization happens, Those two copies join one from the other parent, so the result is three copies in total. Remember, there are supposed to be two. The incorrect number of chromosomes is unpredictable and random and isn't the result of something the parents did before or during pregnancy. When a third copy of a cell joins a pair, a trisomy occurs. Trisomy literally means three bodies. If someone receives an Edwards syndrome diagnosis, they have a third copy of chromosome 18 in their cells. There is no cure for Edwards syndrome, which is trisomy 18. An Edwards syndrome diagnosis can result in a live birth, but trisomy 18 most often causes a miscarriage during the first three months of pregnancy, or the baby is stillborn. So, so yeah. did your doctor make a recommendation for what you should do? Or did they just say, look, here's the situation you're facing. Here are your options. Go think about it. How, did you get some guidance? How do you, I can't even, first of all, I can't fathom being in a room finding out that I have twins and I would do exactly what you did. I would immediately <laughs> <laughs> turn into, I don't have enough car seats. There's going to be twice as many diapers, <laughs> twice as much food. I would immediately do that. But then- in the space of just, you know, a few minutes to half an hour, now you're finding out, I have this, but it's coming with this massive complication. And then just a few days to learn about that and realize that you, you ha- do have to make a decision about what you're going to do. There's no ignoring it. Did you have some guidance or some help or some groups or something? Um, I, I uh, first, I made the decision, It w- um, you know, I think when you're pregnant, time is never on your side, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And so I, um, I, I first, I remember being in the room of the hospital with this, um, with this expert, I believe it was like a geneticist type of person explaining, Mm -hmm. you know, explaining what trisomy 18 was and what the risks were. Um, And, you know, and, either this woman or the doctor walking through the options, but not rec- making a recommendation. Um, and the option that they put on the table for me was um, having what they called a selective reduction, essentially an abortion of the baby with trisomy 18. Mm-hmm. And so I left the hospital, my husband and I left the hospital that day with all of that information. And I went home and um, I, I poured over. I I, I, um, I have a master's in public health. I have some 
background in, you know, not the medical field, but in understanding scientific literature. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I really delved into the research and evidence around trisomy 18. Um, I did find that there were some support groups online. This is now 15 years ago. It might, the, you know, the situation might be, you know, really different or might have evolved a lot, but I I did find, find some support groups of people who did choose to, um, you know, move forward with pregnancies with babies that had trisomy 18. Um, and, um, and I also had a, um, a college friend, my, uh, actually my freshman year college roommate, who was a dear friend who was an OBGYN and I called her mm. and, um, and she really helped me, um, as, you know, uh, walk through, you know, some of the medical details from her perspective. Um, mm-hmm. and, you know, it was, it was really over, um, a, a couple of days where I um, I made the decision, you know I, I I think when it comes down to it I you know I'd been so happy to be pregnant I I um, <laughs> twins were a total you know totally out of left field but <laughs> awesome um, but now I I was really faced with the prospect of losing both babies mm-hmm. and so. Um, you know, within a couple of days, I made um, what became a very clear decision, but also an anguished decision to have an abortion of the fetus with trisomy 18. Um, I think once you once you start to think about, you know, this baby growing in you, it's like it, it's it's powerful. Um, mm-hmm. You you know, you want to do everything you can to um, to um, to make the best decisions as you know, as as a um, mom to be <laughs> mm-hmm. and, and for myself. I can't imagine trying to think through, I have twins and I have to, as a mom, I can't imagine trying to think through, I have twins and I have to do what's best for both of them. And I would assume it's the, that thought process must include, if you know that um, chancing it puts the healthy fetus at risk for p- the possible reward of giving birth, I'm, I'm using reward in air quotes, of giving birth mm-hmm. to two babies, one of whom I'm assuming that's pretty painful for that child. If that child does make it to term and lives for those five to 15 days, if trisomy 18 has affected almost all of their organs, that can't be a a good experience for that baby either. I just, no, I just... I also- I'm so sorry. I also had to think about it through the perspective of my older daughter. You know, what would it mm. have? I mean, I, I think there's would be real trauma to bring, you know, to, um, it, it, and it was an uh, unlikely scenario that I could get to the point of having delivering mm-hmm. two twins, right? It was an unlikely scenario. But even if I were able to, um, you know, then you think of the trauma of bringing a baby, a sibling into the world that, um, you know, that's alive just for a few days. Mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it was, um, there's, there's lots, so many different, so many different angles that you had to, you know, that I had to consider, but that's why I think it became so clear. You know, I had the potential to have, um, I had, you know, I had a, a tragic pregnancy, but I had the potential to have a healthy baby in the Mm -hmm. end. And that's Mm -hmm. what I did. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, my, my daughter Harper is now, 13 and she's this she's incredible she is just such an awesome kid and um, I look at her sometimes and realize like wow I you know I'm um I I I'm I'm so fortunate to have been able to bring her into the world and Mm -hmm. um yeah so I, I think of you know I I think it was um it was it was a hard decision while I was making it and then it became so clear to me. I, I, it was the only option for me. Was that, you said that you had moved to Maine. <clears throat> I don't know much about Maine, but I don't think there are many metropolitan areas there. Were you able to get this taken care of where you had moved? No, I, I live in Portland, um, which is the biggest city in, in Maine, but they didn't have the, um, the medical expertise here. So I actually had to go down to Boston. Um, which is about a two, uh, which is about two hours away. Um, my husband and I drove, um, uh, but it, 
but even that was, you know, um, there was a lot of complexity. We both had to take time off of work and find childcare um, because, you know, we were, um, we were, we were, we were, you know, went down and back in the day over one day, but we were gone for a good portion of the day. So we had to, um, you know, find extra childcare for our, our older daughter. So you drove two hours away, had the procedure. I assume there was a little bit of recovery time and then you drove back home that night. Yes. And did your other daughter, so she's only three, I guess at this point, does she know what's going on at this point? No, not at that point. You know, we've been very open with as a family, Mm -hmm. um, but not, you know, she was too little at that moment to understand. They're 13 and 16 now, right? Yes. Mm, I hope you have lots of caffeine with two teenagers (laughs) from from one mom of two teens to another mom of two teens. (laughs) Two teenage girls. Last last weekend, we had both the prom and a 13-year-old birthday party on the same night. I'm not sure. Oh, girl. (laughs) Oh, my sympathies. My deepest sympathies. Um, We had, last year, we had eighth grade graduation and high school graduation back to back. And I I don't think I've ever been so emotionally wrung out in a good way in my life. (laughs) It's just like what is happening right now. Um, So, but, but you said they do know. So do, have they shared their, I'm sure they have shared their thoughts with you about this, their feelings about this. I'm wondering what the experience is like here where your children know that you made this choice. Are they, do they have thoughts about that and feelings about that? Um, I think that for my older daughter, who's 16, I want to say pride because Mm -hmm. she knows what we went through was really hard to be able to have her sister. And she feels like we, um, you know, know, she's she's a really thoughtful kid. (laughs) So I, I think she, I think she sees both like, how yeah the, how extraordinary it is that um that we have her sister and then also you know knows that that was you know it was a it was a hard experience for us and feels like wow my family went through this hard thing and maybe you know we're stronger for it um mm-hmm. i i you know i haven't cried yet today talking with you but i typically cry when i talk about it understandable and, you know, I think her seeing, you know, seeing that emotion and feeling and, you know, understanding how, um, yeah, how lucky we are as a family to be able to have come out of this really troubled pregnancy with a healthy baby um, is something really, you know, it's really special. So, yeah, mm-hmm. I, um, I, yeah, I think, and then my younger daughter, I think still kind of grapples with it. It's, it's a lot to think you were, a, you had a twin and that mm-hmm. other didn't make it. And um, so, you know, she's 13. I, I, it, I She's, she's never experienced anything, you know, and uh, said anything negative about it, but it's just, I don't, you know, I think it's, it's a lot to get your head around. Mm-hmm. As it would be for any sibling to lose a sibling at yes. any point of life. Absolutely. I mean, Absolutely. that is a lot to grapple with, especially as, She's 13. That's <laughs> absolutely. Um, I wanted to ask you, I wanted to, to clarify. I think that what you said at the beginning of our conversation resonated so strongly with me of as a mom, you had to sit down with this decision and yes, you had a husband and yes, you had people helping you and you had doctors and a best friend talking to you. But at the end of the day, you were a mom who had two fetuses inside of you and you had to make a decision here and having the power and ability to do that seems important because I'm not sure how for you anyone would really be able to grapple with what you had to grapple with all of Mm -hmm. those details and the outcome of whatever course of action you chose so I'm very glad that you had the opportunity to make yeah. that choice for yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, something you just said just resonated so much, which was I can remember sitting at my computer looking at the research and really um, uh, making the decision. I, I don't want to say that this in a in you know a, a negative way about 
um, my husband at all because he was incredibly supportive and we had a great relationship and, you know, we were in it together, but it was my decision. Um, Mm -hmm. even my husband, like I, I was the one who was like, this is what we're going to do. Um, and here's why. And I think it, I mean, it's my body, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. it has, it, it has to be. Um, but you know, if I think now that there are states where the abortion I had to save the life of, of my twin would be illegal. um, That's my state. What you wouldn't yeah. be able to today, yeah. you would not be able to do that unless you could find two doctors to say, absolutely, it's going to cost. I don't, actually, our law here it would have to, they would have to say it would cost your life. I'm not sure in the case of it's going to cost the other, the twin's life. If she, because this this twin is going to likely cause a miscarriage and that's going to not be far enough along in the pregnancy for the other twin to survive. And yeah, no, there's no exception here in this state right now for that. It, and, it would have cost both twins. And I there was there was uh, I, I was healthy throughout. I mean, maybe I wouldn't have stayed healthy, but mm-hmm. that early on at 10, 11, um, I think I, I had the selective reduction or the abortion around 11 and a half weeks. Mm-hmm. Like that, that um, I was healthy at that point. My, my, it wasn't, you know, my health wasn't at issue. It was the health of my, um, of my healthy twin. Mm-hmm. Any children after Harper or were you done? Uh, <laughs> <at that point? laughs> I, I was done. And in part because that pregnancy scared you know, mm-hmm. scared the heck out of me, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. you realize, and it, and especially in contrast to my first pregnancy was just so easy. You realize like, you know, this is, um, these things aren't in your control, right? It's not. Uh, and I was older at the time I ha- I was pregnant with Harper when I was 36. Um, and at that point they, you know, I, every, every medical record said I had advanced maternal age. Um, oh, how kind. <laughs> I found, you know, really interesting. Um, but, you know, it made, me, it made me realize, you know, even if I had um, wanted to be pregnant again, it, it, it kind of convinced me not to not to try. Um, but that's mm-hmm. OK. I have two beautiful girls, um, mm. beautiful girls who are the center of my life. And, um, you know, and I, I um, yeah, I feel so lucky to um, to be, you know, to to have ended or to have gotten out of such a hard pregnancy with a healthy baby. I, you know, I went through the rest of that pregnancy. It was a hard pregnancy throughout. Um, the doctors were worried that my, um, that the fetus that survived um, was, um, was too small. And um, I was constantly uh, doing ultrasounds um, weekly, every 10 days Um but I ended up um, having Harper um, two weeks after my due date. Um, so she. Oh, wow. <laughs> she was comfortable. <laughs> she said, I'm good. I'm all good, mom. Thanks. <laughs> she, she was eight pounds, nine ounces. So not small. <laughs> she was totally fine. <laughs> and so healthy. And um, pretty quickly, we started calling her Happy Harper because she's just like a. Oh an easygoing kid and um yeah it was it was it was a it was a hard hard pregnancy um but she you know she's we've been so fortunate she's she was healthy as a baby she's been healthy throughout her life um she's so strong now she's taller than I'm tall and she's taller than I am at 13 and she's so strong <laughs> I have to hand her jars to open now when I can't. Open Me too. Them. Oh my gosh, that's so demoralizing. <laughs> oh, when you have to hand it to them and they can do it with ease, and you're like, okay, all right, now I'm advanced age. I understand. <laughs> I kind of love it because it's, um, yeah, she's, yeah, she's, she's a strong kid, and um, and and she she wears that as a badge of honor. You know, I think when I was a t- when I was a tall young person, I would slump, and she stands proud. So mm-hmm. I love that. Again, as the mom of a six foot tall, 15 year old girl, I'm right oh, there with you. <laughs> that is awesome. <laughs> she stands tall. Yes, she does. 
I want to I want to thank you again so much for coming on and and telling your story. It it strikes me that you know you had to make this excruciating decision, but don't we have to do that as moms for the rest yeah. of their lives? We're always yeah. we're yeah. always making hard calls. Yes. Trying to make the best call we possibly can for them every single day. I think I think we're all doing that all the time. Absolutely. That is so true. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on, Emily. I appreciate it. Rebecca, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate what you're doing. Um, and I appreciate um, telling my being able to tell my story um, because I do think there's a lot of complexity to it. And it's you don't always know if you don't if you don't go through experience like mine, it's it, it's not what you typically see on TV or what you experience yourself necessarily. And so it's so important to understand the range of experiences that um, that women have and Mm -hmm. the critical need for the critical need for abortion care. Emily's story reminds me of how impossible it is to foresee all the complications that can happen in pregnancy. I know that my own blindsided me. Emily's did her as well. So did Samantha's that you heard about back in episode one. And the three of us are not alone, as you'll hear in coming episodes. There's simply no way to create an exhaustive list of what can go wrong. And even further, to think through all of the people who will be affected by however that complication is handled. Samantha had two children at home who needed her to survive that third pregnancy so that she could come home to them. Harper needed a mom who would protect her from the miscarriage that one of her babies would most likely induce before Harper could develop enough to survive outside of Emily. Samantha and Emily both had access to information. They read it, they talked with people they loved, and they got guidance. And then they decided the best course of action for themselves and their families. Ten years ago, I would not have afforded them that opportunity because I didn't know they needed it. I did not know that abortion can be necessary, that it can be the very thing that saves a life. I wasn't looking at the life of the mother, much less any of the children or family around her. But like I told you in episode one with Samantha, hearing Emily's story forced me to wrestle with a hard truth. My name is Emily, and I have a right to life. My name is Harper and I have a right to life. You've been listening to Right to Life on the 1C Story Network. If you have a story to share or would like to learn more, please visit righttolifestories.com. This show is brought to you by the generous support of people who value life. To contribute, visit writetolifestories.com and click on the GoFundMe icon or get in touch. The One Sea Story Network for the love of stories.